Now we're going to talk about zero knowledge, um, in particular zero knowledge proofs of knowledge and secure multi-party computations. Now these are two of the more modern parts of cryptography and uh, zero knowledge proofs has been around since uh, the 80s and uh, secure multi-party computation is not that much younger. So we will start working through secure multi-party computation and say what that is. And then we will talk about zero knowledge proofs of knowledge in general. Now, uh, a classic example of secure multi-party computation is Yao's millionaire's problem. So the, the scenario is posed like this. So there are two millionaires uh, out walking and they meet in the street and they want to find out who is the richer. However, they don't want to reveal how many millions they each have. So they want to find out who is the richer without actually revealing to the other uh, how much money they have. So for instance, it might be the difference of uh, one kruna or one euro or something, uh, but then they wouldn't know. So it might just as well uh, be twice uh, the amount uh, as well. So the idea is, uh, is this, we have n participants, p1 up to pn here, and each person has a secret input value, uh, x, uh, that they want to uh, put in to this function. Uh, but they really desperately, and they desperately want to know this uh, the evaluation of this function on this secret uh, input uh, x and learn uh, the output y. Now, so each person somehow managed to, to input their uh, secret without revealing it to any of the other parties. Now, the trivial solution is that these uh, n participants agree on a trusted third party and then uh, they give their secret uh, to this trusted third party and uh, this trusted third party then performs the computation so evaluates f on all these secret inputs and then returns the output to each of the participants and uh, then no other participant has learned the secret output of any of the others. Uh, so this is the trivial solution and it turns out we will actually use this trivial solution uh, in the signing uh, how to do this. So the definition of secure multi-party computation is that yeah we have these n participants, we have the n uh, secret inputs and then we have a protocol pi which is executed by these parties and at the end of the protocol each participant learns uh, y which is the, the output of this function uh, on uh, taking this function on these secret inputs x1 to, to xn here and the participants executing this protocol pi should be equivalent uh, to giving these secret inputs to a trusted third party uh, who computes this function and returns y to each participant. So now you, you see the relation uh, to the, the trivial solution that we have. So we, for, for a, a protocol to be a secure multi-party computation protocol, we actually need to prove that uh, these two, the trivial solution and the solution at hand, actually are equivalent, that uh, they gave the same results. Um, so uh, one wouldn't leak more uh, than the other. Of course, they would uh, behave differently and this protocol pi uh, doesn't have a trusted third party. It's just run by these n participants. 
uh, but we can we should still be able to prove that it's equivalent so as if they all gave it to a third party uh, who, who is trusted and trustworthy and uh, each participant here uh, learns no more about uh, the excess of other people than what is revealed by the why. So, uh, so depending on what the function is, maybe you can infer uh, some other's uh, secret input uh, from this uh, why. Now, in, in general, uh, this problem is solved and we can construct uh, protocols for arbitrary functions. So that's nice to know. Uh, however, efficiency varies and uh, some protocols can be really inefficient if you construct them in this general way, but uh, there are practi practically feasible uh, protocols. Uh, that are much more uh, efficient. So for instance, sometimes we can use uh, homomorphisms of uh, certain crypto systems uh, to do this. For instance, if the, uh, if the, if the function is uh, uh, multiplication and multiplying all these uh, x's together, then uh, we could use the homomorphism of uh, Elegamala, for instance, and this would uh, solve this problem. Uh, but we can construct uh, rather complex functions too. So one uh, example is uh, sugar beet auctions. So this has been implemented in practice. Uh, so there is a paper uh, where they uh, actually implemented this in practice in 2009, Probably they implemented it in 2008 and published a paper in 2009. And uh, this was done in Denmark. So uh, in Denmark, there are several thousands of farmers uh, that produce sugar beets, which is used to uh, produce uh, sugar. And uh, these sugar beets, the farmers sell them to the monopoly Danisco, uh, so the sugar producer, or Don Sukker, I think they are called now. Uh, and um, uh, these uh, contracts, yeah, so for the farmers selling sugar beets uh, to the sugar producer, uh, these are allocated uh, through a nationwide exchange, uh, through a double auction. And uh, a double auction uh, has several uh, sellers and several buyers. And the purpose is to find the market clearing price. So it, uh, it works like this. Uh, each buyer places a bid specifying how much he's willing to buy at each potential price. So if uh, he has to pay uh, one euro or one kroner per, uh, uh, per sugar beet, then he might buy 30 of them, but if he gets them half price, yeah, then he can buy twice as many or uh, and so on. And uh, at the same time, each seller also says how much they are willing to sell at each given price. Uh, so for instance, if they don't get paid enough, uh, they, they might not uh, want to sell uh, that much. And uh, the auctioneer in this case uh, simply computes the total supply and demand for each price and uh, they want to find where supply equals demand uh, so that all the farmers get to sell all their uh, sugar beets and uh, the sugar producer uh, gets to buy uh, as many sugar beets as needed. And uh, when this is done, uh, anyone who has specified uh, a non-zero amount for his price, so something larger than zero, uh, may trade sugar beets at this price. So this has actually been implemented in, in practice uh, as a secure multi-party computation protocol. So that is the the auctioneer in this case uh, didn't have to be a trusted third party, but the, uh, 
Yeah, but the sugar farmers, the beet farmers, uh, they could run this protocol uh, together with uh, Danisk or Don Sucker uh, as uh, to together without uh, the farmers being worried that uh, Don Sucker would see the uh, prices that they were willing to sell for, so they could uh, underbid uh, and. Uh, the other way around that the farmers could see how much uh, Don Sucker was uh, willing to pay and uh, thus uh, increase their prices unnecessarily. So everyone uh, should be happy here and they, they could uh, do it uh, just these mutually untrusting uh, parties. Now let's move to uh, zero knowledge proofs of knowledge. Uh, we, we'll start with an example here. So Alice must prove her identity to Eve. Uh, so this is a, a classic setting. Now Eve has Alice's public key and knows it belongs to Alice. So this should be quite easy. And uh, Alice will then prove uh, her identity by proving that she's the owner of the private key. Uh, so the private key key corresponding to the public key that Eve knows it belongs to Alice. Now one uh, way of doing this is that yeah, Eve can ask Alice to sign a message M and if Alice can do this then obviously she must know the private key uh, corresponding to the public key so then Eve can believe Alice. Uh, so if the, she can produce a valid signature on the message M, then uh, this should be fine. Now the problem is here, uh, Eve choose, uh, chooses the message and uh, this results in Alice's signature being on this message. So what if Eve choose the message, uh, I will give all my money to Eve? Uh, well, then Alice must sign this to uh, prove her identity, but then uh, Eve has the message, I will give all my money to Eve, signed by Alice. So this is uh, not good, because this can be uh, abused. Uh, so the idea is this, uh, Alice wants to prove that she knows the discrete logarithm x of a value g of x. So this is uh, basically, so x is the private key and g of g to the power of x is the the public key. So this is exactly the case in uh, uh, both uh, Diffie-Hellman and uh, Elgamal uh, that we've looked at. And uh, she wants to do this without revealing the X to Eve or give Eve any of these uh, types of, of signatures uh, that Eve can abuse. Now, there was this uh, protocol proposed in the early 90s by uh, Schnorr. So this is called Schnorr's protocol or Schnorr's uh, identification scheme. And here the prover wants to prove knowledge of uh, some X uh, for, uh, uh, which is a discrete logarithm uh, that uh, the prover knows. So the verifier simply knows uh, G to the power of X uh, denoted as Y uh, in, in the protocol here. And uh, the way we do this is that the prover commits to some randomness R and does that by uh, sending, uh, computing G to the power of R and uh, sending that to the verifier. This is denoted T in, in, in here. And the verifier replies with some randomly chosen challenge uh, C and uh, after the prover receives C, uh, the prover computes uh, S here, which is simply R uh, that the prover uh, generated, plus a C that it got as a challenge times X, which is uh, the prover's private key. Now, what happens next is that uh, the verifier does a computation and, uh, well, the verifier uh, does two computations. Uh, to verify the correctness. So the verifier has S on the one hand and uh, can take that, uh, can take G to the power of S 
So that's a valid computation. Uh, the verifier also has T and Y and C. So on the other hand, uh, the verifier will take T, which it got from the prover up here, and it will take Y, which is the public key of the prover, and it will take C that it made up itself and sent to the prover. And it will check if these two are equal. And we, we know here from, uh, from here that S is equal to R plus CX. So this is actually this. And we know uh, this one, uh, we have T, which is G to the power of R. And we have uh, Y, which is G to the power of X. So the, the public key. And then we have C and we take uh, Y to the power of C. And we see here that uh, uh, g to the power of x to the power of c, that's g to the power of uh, cx. And if we multiply with g to the power of r, we get exactly uh, r plus cx up here in the exponent. So then the uh, verifier uh, can accept that this was a valid proof. And uh, the reason that uh, this works um, so first we must uh, show that this is uh, this protocol provides something called completeness and uh, that is that you can actually uh, show that yeah the verifier uh, can uh, accept all uh, statements all possible uh, statements and uh, then we must uh, show something called soundness that uh, for all fa uh, false statements, the verifier will reject. So this makes it uh, a proof of knowledge, uh, these two. So, and finally, uh, we need to prove that it's zero knowledge, uh, which is uh, one of the properties that we want. So you can have a proof of knowledge without it being uh, zero knowledge. For instance, uh, one proof of uh, knowledge is uh, uh, passwords and you show that you know the password by giving up the password. Uh, but that's uh, very far from uh, zero, being zero knowledge. Now, uh, to show that this is uh, zero knowledge, uh, we can look at the transcript for a protocol. So the transcript is simply a tuple of these three values. The first is uh, the T, which is the commitment to the randomness that the uh, prover does. And second is the C, which is the challenge uh, submitted by the, the verifier to the prover. And finally, we have S, which is the response of the prover. Now, if we look at the probability for a particular transcript occurring, uh, there are two things that are chosen at random. And first, it's uh, the T here, because uh, the prover chooses an R and then computes T. Uh, so this is uh, chosen uniformly at random from some set R here. And the second, uh, value that is chosen random, that's C. And that's also chosen uniformly at random uh, from some set uh, R prime here. And maybe they are even the, the same, uh, R and R prime are the same set, but uh, not necessarily. Uh, S here, that one is computed deterministically uh, based on T and C here. Uh, so that's why we don't have a factor uh, of that in there. Now the idea is that uh, if, a, uh, if we can construct a simulator that can simulate uh, this protocol without knowing the secret, uh, then it, uh, it is zero, zero knowledge because then at such a transcript doesn't carry any information about the secret. So if we can uh, create a protocol which is uh, where each uh, transcript in the in in this uh, where each entry in this transcript uh, is valid according to the protocol, but it was generated by a simulator that doesn't know X at all, 
then obviously this transcript doesn't reveal anything uh, about X. So that's the idea. And the way we can uh, create such a simulator is that we first randomly choose a C, and then we randomly choose an S, and then we can compute T by taking G to the power of S multiplied by Y to the power of C. And then we will simply get the, uh, the T that we needed. And uh, we can see here actually that this uh, yields the same probability distribution as we had from above here. So we, we choose C at uh, uniformly at random, we choose S uniformly at random, and then we get uh, the T uh, as well, which is in this case the one that's uh, computed deterministically. But uh, the probability distribution uh, will be the same. And uh, this means that the simulated transcripts are indistinguishable from uh, real transcripts. And uh, this means that uh, the transcript doesn't reveal any information about the secret S, uh, uh, the secret X, sorry. Uh, but uh, it does convince uh, the verifier that the prover actually uh, knows X because we get that from the proof of knowledge properties. And that was everything uh, for this time. Uh, thanks a lot.